The Senate Committee on Government Affairs will come to order. Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice Chair Orenshell. Senator Gorkachia. Here. Senator Daly. Here. Senator Krasner. Here. Chair Flores. Uh, present. Please let the record reflect uh, that Vice Chair Orenshaw is absent excused. Should he make his way into the building, please uh, mark him as present. Uh, but we do have four members present. We have a quorum. Good afternoon. Welcome all to the Committee on Government Affairs. We are going to open up with the hearings and then we'll do the work session last only because our Vice Chair is presenting a bill presently and we need him to come back. Um, with that, we will open up with Senate Bill 446. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and committee members. For the record, my name is Timothy Galuzzi, and I'm the administrator for the Enterprise Information Technology Services Division, also known as EATS, in the Department of Administration and the, Chief's and the State Chief Information Officer. With me today are Jovan Sotak, my Chief of Policy and Communications, and Daniel Marlow, the administrator of the Administrative Services Division in the Department of Administration. I am here today to introduce Senate Bill 446, which proposes changes to NRS 242 to clarify language or legislative discretion to directly appropriate funds to certain improvements. During the 2021 legislative session, NRS 242.211 was interpreted to prohibit direct appropriations to EATS that do not need to be paid back by internal service funds. As a result, information technology improvements managed by EATS are often financed typically via general fund loan, with payback terms that outlive the investment's useful life. These loans can lead to rate shock. I lost my spot. <laughs> these, uh, these loans can le also lead to rate shock with the cost of enterprise level improvements are passed to customers via the EATS cost pools. Rate shock avoidance has contributed to delayed maintenance and delayed replacement of end-of-life systems, putting the state's IT infrastructure and security at risk. There is historical precedent to support the direct appropriation to EATS. Instead, workarounds have been utilized to appropriate funding to non-EATS budget accounts and decentralize investments to using agencies when enterprise, service, when enterprise solutions would be more cost-effective, transparent, and create more compatible systems and operations. Additionally, prohibiting direct appropriations for EATS is inconsistent with how other internal service funds, such as Fleet Services Division, are managed. SB 446 clarifies the ability of EATS to receive direct appropriations without utilizing a workaround solution. This cleanup of language in NRS 242 will allow the legislature to increase transparency of IT investments, further deploy appropriate enterprise solutions, and increase consistency with how internal service funds are managed. The passage of this bill is necessary for the EATS general fund appropriations in Assembly Bills 482, 487, 488, and 506 to move forward. If passed, SB 446 would benefit EATS's customers if appropriations are made in lieu of general fund loans when funding is available. Then agencies would not absorb the cost of a project's loan through the EATS assessments and rates. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to introduce this bill. At this time, I can answer any questions the committee may have. And thank you for the presentation. Members, any questions? We good to go, Skip? I think, I think we're good for now. Thank you for the presentation. Appreciate the brevity, too. Um, and with that, we'd like to invite those wishing to testify in support to please come forward at either in Carson City or Las Vegas. Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to testify in support of Assembly, uh, excuse me, Senate Bill 446? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you, BPS. We'll stay on the phone. Anybody wishing to testify in opposition? 
The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And is there anybody wishing to speak in opposition either in Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, BPS will go to the phone. Anybody wishing to testify in the neutral position for Senate Bill 446? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. And the lastly, we will invite anybody in Carson City or Las Vegas wishing to testify in the neutral position. Seeing none, uh, any closing remarks we may have, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, once again, Timothy Galuzzi, for the record, I want to thank you and the committee for the opportunity to introduce this bill. We feel that this provides the legislature more flexibility, and that that's always a good thing for us. So uh, we, we appreciate your support in this moving forward. Thank you. Assemblyman Gray is not in the room, correct? And I apologize if I'm missing you, but I don't think I see you. But I do see Assemb Assemblywoman Considine. Um, so we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 446. And next we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 225. I'm sorry. Which one? Assemblywoman, do you have a, a bill that you're presenting now? Oh, you're just here for work session. I apologize. Uh, as, as, Assemblywoman Newby, please. Uh, Assembly Bill 225. And Assemblywoman, I think, I, I don't know if you heard my announcement, but I just wanted to make sure to be fair. Um, we do not have Senator Ornshaw here, so we will be doing work session at the very end. And we have three additional bill presentations. May I begin? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Senate Government Affairs Committee. It's great to be with you today. Um, I am here to present Assembly Bill 225. And this bill actually originated from a request from one of my constituents regarding his exposure uh, and his name being published as a result of a military action that he undertook while he was in active duty um, serving in the military. His information was published by Al-Qaeda, uh, or actually ISIS, um, and this is part of an ongoing campaign that they uh, are waging against military members. Now, when we got to the legislative session, we realized, well, there are many different bills that are related to the confidentiality of information of certain individuals. And over in the assembly side, uh, I had worked with uh, your counterpart, uh, Mr. Chair, Chair Torres, to work on this bill to, instead of adding all of these different new categories of individuals to be exempted in this confidentiality uh, of information bill, that we would instead allow a fail-safe that would essentially get to the situation I was trying to address where there's a constituent who has a threat against them um, without necessarily adding new categories. So AB 225 was uh, heavily amended in the Assembly Government Affairs and as a result now it requires that if a person um, has a threat against them, they may petition the court and through a preponderance of evidence, the court may decide that yes, this person has a threat against them and yes, uh, having their information kept confidential would be of benefit in addressing the threat issue. Um, so it set up a process by which that could happen really for anyone facing a threat as an alternative to adding new categories of, of folks. It also um, 
includes, because in the Secretary of State's office, they uh, had a concern about election workers. And so it does allow for a government employee to petition on behalf of others that they employ, other governmental employees, uh, to get this exemption. So um, as they uh, take the job uh, and are in employment in elections that uh, their either Secretary of State or someone else would be able to petition on their behalf, and that was made for um, ease of use. Um, I'd be happy to walk through the bill in detail if you would like, but that's the really the crux of it. It does make some conforming changes also based on the state clerk's requirements or request that the petition that is filed for all of all of these folks um, be uniform because the petition previously was one different petition for this group of folks and a different petition for this group of folks. So it was easier for them to process if it was just made the same petition. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or go through section by section. I think uh, I think we all read the bill. Uh, I think the. Uh we don't need to spend a lot of time on that, and let, so we'll open it up for questions. I see our chair coming back, so I'll, I'll go back to him, and then I'll tell him I have questions. Mr. Chair, I, I also neglected to say there are a couple of folks who have amendments that they would like to offer on this bill. Uh, I consider them friendly uh, and leave it up to the discretion of this committee and your wisdom to include them or not, and I will let those proponents describe what they're trying to do. Sounds good, and we, we, we can discuss that after the bill itself. Uh, Senator Daly, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the first one is pretty easy, I think. So in Section 4, Sub 1, on Line 12, um, you can tell me, but it looks like the A such is, or such A, the A doesn't belong there. But okay. I'm sorry, Section 4, Sub... One, first, uh, number one, okay. line 12. Okay, step one. Where it says, any such A petition. I don't, oh. think, I don't think A belongs there. You have some eagle eyes there, Senator Daly. Read logically is all. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so then the question that I do have is in, uh, and it's maybe just a, a language thing in uh, Section 8, Subsection G, where you're uh, talking about, you were talking about district attorneys and stuff, uh, those various things, and you just changed it to any prosecutor. So I just wanted to confirm, and maybe legal can, can tell us. Uh, so anytime there's a prosecutor, it's always going to be the government that's prosecuting the case, I think. So by just saying any prosecutor, you're talking about public entities that are prosecuting a case. So anybody that fits into that public definition. I, I'm, I was trying to think if there was going to be any type of private situation where you were prosecuting, and I couldn't. So I just wanted to be clear that we're talking about public uh, prosecutions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Through you to Senator Daly. I believe that would be a legal question because I think that's conforming language with other sections in the NRS, but I would kick it to them. And we can go to our legal, please. Thank you. For the record, this is Heidi Clarkson with the Legislative Council Bureau. So uh, in making the um, existing sections of law consistent, um, the term prosecutor is used. Uh, the term prosecutor is also defined um, on page, uh, for example, page 7 of the bill. It says uh, prosecutor has the meaning ascribed to it in NRS 241.030. And looking at that section of law, um, NRS 241.030 uh, states that prosecutor means the attorney general, the district attorney of a county, the city attorney of an incorporated city, or any deputy attorney or other attorney or person employed by the attorney general or a district attorney or city attorney. So there is a, a because of the definition of prosecutor, it is only um, 
these attorneys that work um, in the public sector that would be that this would apply to and, and thank you for that that answers my question and I what I was thinking I just wanted to confirm um, and then other than that I think the way you're trying to go about this is uh, is is in order so thank you members any additional questions Seeing none, at this time we'll invite you to sit back and we'll invite those wishing to testify and support to please come forward, Carson City or Las Vegas. Uh, thank you, Chair Flores, members of the committee, Gabriel DeCara, for the record, Chief Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, on behalf of Secretary Francisco Aguilar, we are incredibly grateful to Assemblywoman uh, Newby for bringing this bill and working with us. Um, we've talked a number of times about the threats and harassment that have faced election workers. Um, this kind of protection would be very important. We are grateful, uh, as Senator Daly said, that Assemblywoman Newby found a way to collect all of this um, into a single bill instead of kind of uh, drawing the statute out further and further. And again, the, the provision to be able to have an employee's information uh, be protected in advance of threats being received because we know these employees will continue to be targeted is very important. So uh, on behalf of Secretary Aguilar, we're in support of this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, <laughs> members of the committee, uh, staff, Rick McCann, Nevada Association of Public Safety Officers and a member of the Nevada Law Enforcement Coalition. Um, I we are one of the people who want to incorporate into this bill and make an amendment to add what essentially was before you here about a month or so ago was SB 83. Uh, SB 83 uh, passed out of this committee and then 21 on the Senate floor. We took a look at uh, Assemblywoman Newby's bill and it looked like it was pretty much going to be capturing the same thing we wanted to accomplish. So we're here today to try to stick our noses into this one and see if we can add to it. Uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Senator Flores, if I'm not mistaken, who said that uh, SB 83 was probably one of the finest uh, pieces of legislative uh, um, stuff you'd ever seen. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so since we have a great bill and uh, Assemblywoman Newby's got a great bill, we are trying to get, oh, by the way, she was 41 -0. So, I mean, you know, we're talking about some good stuff here. The woman knows what she's doing. Um, so the mere fact that she's going to allow us in shows further brilliance on her part. So we would ask that SB 83 uh, and the things that it brought to its bill be incorporated into uh, this particular bill at AB 225 as well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, please. Morgan Biasali here at Silver State Government Relations representing Las Vegas City Employees Association and we want to ditto the last comments. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Ellis, Communication Workers of America, Local 9413. We support the bill. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chair. Um, Susie Martinez, Executive Secretary, Treasurer of the Nevada AFL-CIO. Um, we support this bill and no employee or worker should not be safe at their job. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Christine McDermott speaking on behalf of the National Judicial College. Uh, we are speaking to uh, applaud Senator Newby in including judicial officers as an amendment to this bill as they are under increasing threat. And we would like them to have the beginning steps of protections that federal judges do have already. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Senior Judge Larry Sage, and, and I just wanted to, re my wife wanted me to remind, uh, I was elected, uh, local officials used to be elected in June. I was elected on a Thursday in June and was sworn in on Monday, and in between those dates, with just my name and the phone book and phone number, uh, my home recording message service uh, got uh, all kinds of disgusting messages for my uh, children and wife to hear from uh, supporters of the incumbent judge I defeated. So it started even bef by the time I got elected and before I got sworn in. So, and that's before all the internet stuff. So I'm just urging you support the bill so they don't have to go through what some of us have gone through. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to join us in support? Seeing none. A BPS will go to those wishing to testify in opposite, excuse me, in support over the phone. If you would like to testify in support of AB 225, please press star 9 now. Take your place in the queue.
There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. And we will stay on the phone, BPS, anybody wishing to testify in opposition. If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 225, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And is there anybody wishing to testify in opposition, either in Carson City or Las Vegas? If you could please come forward. Seeing none, BPS, anybody wishing to testify in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 225, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And is there anybody wishing to testify in the neutral position? BPS on the phone, please. If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 225, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. And anyone wishing to testify in the neutral position, Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, Assemblywoman, any closing remarks? And, and I forgot to ask, and if you could address in your closing remarks, and it, it's not necessarily meant to engage in a technical legal question. I, I am just curious, preponderance of the evidence versus clear and convincing, et cetera, if there's just some conversation that that triggered why you wanted to go with that standard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Sabre Newby, District 10. Um, that language is actually provided to me by uh, the Eighth Judicial Court um, as the standard that they thought would be best for their uh, judges. When we were looking at putting this into place, uh, my question to them was, being a non-lawyer, you know, what what steps or what sort of legal standard would you like to have in place for that? And that's what they had suggested to me. So that's what I went with. Thank you. And just in closing, uh, I think I should hang out in uh, Senate government affairs more often. I got called brilliant. My bill is great. I was called a senator. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your time today, and I appreciate your uh, consideration of both the bill and the amendments from some of our advocates. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing. And I'm looking at my agenda here. I think we have, for sure, we can do Assemblywoman Duran's bill. So that's 172, right? 171. Uh, and we'll go ahead and close out the hearing and next open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 171. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Flores. It's good to see you. I think I've seen you twice in one day. Well, it's been a <laughs> uh, good to see you and as well as the committee. Thank you, Chair Flores and the committee. I am B. Duran, representing Assembly District 11 in Clark County. Thank you for the opportunity to present Assembly Bill 171, which revises provisions governing public works. With me today is Greg Esposito, Director of Public Relations and Government Affairs with Plumbers and Pipe Fitters and Service Technicians, Local 525. I would like to provide a, excuse me, provide a brief overview of the bill before allowing Mr. Esposito to discuss the background and the need for the bill. Assembly Bill 171 authorizes a public body or its authorized representatives to award a contract for public work to the responsive and responsible bidder offering the best value bid. The measure further sets forth the criteria for a public, pod, for a public body or its authorized representatives to consider in selecting the responsible, responsive and responsible bidder offering the best value bid, including whether the contractor provides 
in health insurance coverage to the contractor's employees and the dependents of such employees. The history of the contractor in complying with certain laws and regulations governing public works and prevailing wage. The history of the contractor in complying with certain laws and regulations governing industrial insurance and whether the contractor offers any workforce training on education programs. And with your indulgence, sir, I would uh, permission to turn it over to Mr. Esposito. Greg Esposito, representing the Nevada State Pipe Trades. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for hearing this bill. I'd like to thank the um, char uh, uh, um, brilliant, if we're, we're going to brilliant Assemblyman Duran for sticking with this bill through its, its amendments. Uh, just to go over a few key points of the bill, um, actually, no, let me start with, um, for many years, the only way that a public body could uh, deliver a public works project or, or, or bid out a public works project was lowest responsive responsible bidder, so low bid. And I don't think anybody in this room would, would build a house just based on the low bid, they would take a look at the contractor's qualifications, whether they had good references, whether you know, they'd go take a look at other houses they had built. And so it's sort of, uh, it sort of hurt public bodies sometimes to have to take low bid. Um, they started, uh, the legislature gave them the ability to start using design bid build and design bid and, and CMAR, um, as opposed to just simply low bid. That's great for very large projects. That's great for, for very large municipalities, uh, public bodies. But this would add another. This would add another tool to their toolbox. This would add another bid or project delivery method um, to their toolbox, where it be where they could take a look at a contractor's qualifications and their history and things like that uh, to see whether or not they would be the right fit for constructing their public work project. Um, in the very first line, uh, the word may. So this is, this is permissive. Uh, a public body can choose to use this or not. Uh, they can keep going with the original low bid. They can go with CMR. Uh, this is just uh, giving them the option to use a tool. And then you'll see the very first amendment um, in, after the first revision. Um, the, a local government may consider the following criteria, which enables them to pick and choose from this list. Uh, they can pick two or three things that really matter to them. Uh, they can omit things that they don't think would work for them. And then uh, in A, I, mo uh, I modify the language to address some of the concerns that are brought up during the assembly committee hearing where the, the term and, and legal definition of bona fide fringe benefits had too much to it that uh, some of the contractors felt uh, they, it would be too difficult to comply with. Uh, so that was something we took um, after testimony. H is added in because there are contractors that win bids being low, but then they execute a whole bunch of change orders that completely change the, the, the cost of the contract to a, a number higher than uh, would have been if they had, if they had uh, included everything in the first place. And then E, F, and G were added um, uh, later on as well just to give uh, the local body some more tools. The uh, final amendment um, was submitted by uh, Joanna Jacob from Clark County. Uh, it modifies um, Three three one three eight five subsection nine, and that language enables the public bodies to use it because without that language, none of the previous language would be able to be used. So, I appreciate your time. Uh, that's the summary of the bill, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, we'll open up with Senator Daly, please. Th thank you, Mr. Chair, and I. Uh, was trying to, I was just going over the amendment. I looked at it a little bit earlier or whatever. And I guess just uh, one question. So would this still work in compliance with uh, the 5% bidder preference? Uh, how would that work if they're doing all this stuff? Because right now you have the 5% bidder preference in there. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure seeing how this would overlap or if it would interfere or wouldn't make any difference. Uh, if everything else was the same, they could apply that 5%. Uh, Greg Esposito, for the record, uh, it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, the 5% bidder's preference is separate from the bidding method. Um, it's something that the, the public body implements, and, and uh, so it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't affect it. Senator, follow-up. Thank you. Senator Guicaccio, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I'm just glad to see the May language in there. I think it could be really cumbersome as the bill was cra originally drafted. You know, 
you'd have to go through all that stuff before you could actually award uh, in some of the rural jurisdictions. You could be six months awarding. So thank you for that. I think you got the senator to agree to your bill. <laughs> Members, any additional questions? And, uh, and I do appreciate uh, the constant work. I, uh, it started somewhere else, and you've, you've constantly been chipping away. So thank you for all the work. We'll invite you both to sit back. And I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 171 to please come forward. Thank you, Chair. For the record, my name is Susie Martinez, and I am the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Nevada State AFL-CIO. And on behalf of over 150,000 members and 120 unions, we are in strong support of the bill. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Please. Mark Ellis, President, Communication Workers of America, Local 9413. We support the bill. And thank you for joining us. Please. Sarah Collins with I3 Public Affairs, representing the National Electrical Contractor Association of Northern Nevada. Um, we are in support of the bill as well. And thank you for joining us. Please. Aiden Downey, representing the Southern Nevada chapter of the National Electri Electri Electrical Contract Association. We support the bill. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to testify in support Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, BPS, anybody wishing to join us over the phone for Assembly Bill 171? If you would like to testify in support of AB 171, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Um, good afternoon. Um, this is Dion Klug, D I O N N E K O U G. I'm with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 711, of Las Vegas, and we support this bill. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Good afternoon, Chairman Flores and the members of the committee. For the record, my name is Robert Sumlin, R O B E R T S U M L I N. And I'm with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local Lodge SC711, Las Vegas, Nevada. I urge the committee to support this legislation because it will ensure that the state has full transparency of a contractor's history, including how it has treated workers in the past when hiring for public work. I strongly urge the committee to support Assembly Bill 171. Thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in opposition to please come forward, Carson City or Las Vegas. Welcome, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the Government Affairs Committee. For the record, I'm Ann Barnett, CEO of the Nevada Contractors Association. We represent well over 450 contractors, subcontractors, and industry affiliates. The NCA is in opposition to AB 171. The bill creates a new style of bidding public work projects that includes criteria that is subjective and without clarity. It is unclear how criteria such as past compliance with certain laws, such as prevailing wage, and whether the contractor offers offers a training program will be used to judge the value of a contractor's bid. NCA um, supports the three methods of public works, including low bid, design bid, and construction manager at risk. We believe those um, three methods are sufficient to cover all projects, including those that are unique and or complex. Although we appreciate the sponsor and the proponents and their efforts to meet with us and the stakeholders, we remain in opposition. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Alexis Mudrex with the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors representing the commercial construction industry in Northern Nevada. We are opposed to AB 210. While we do appreciate the proponents' efforts to address our concerns, AGC is fundamentally opposed to best value bidding. We already have a delivery method to address complicated and complex projects that need to take more than just cost into consideration, and that is a construction manager at risk. The language and existing statute for every delivery method has been carefully crafted to ensure that taxpayers 
get the best price in the most fair, transparent, and objective way. Best value bidding is too subjective and likely to be influenced by personal opinions and relationships. This could then turn lead to bid protests and costly delays. Nothing in this bill would prevent a public owner from awarding a contract to whomever they want, regardless of price. Additionally, the one criteria, uh, one of the criteria is to look at the number of change orders, but oftentimes those are initiated by the public owner, but would be used against a contractor under this proposal. The process is not transparent, does not protect the taxpayer, and is unnecessary. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chair Flores and uh, members of the committee, Mac Bybee uh, with the Associated Builders and Contractors of Nevada. I'm not going to repeat what my two colleagues said as I agree with that. I would all like to add that under, um, under Nevada law, the Labor Commissioner has the authority to disqualify anybody who does not follow prevailing wage laws, rules, or regulations, and if they're a repeat offender, they simply can no longer bid on those public works. So there's, so in that way, it's duplicative. And also, under state law, a change order has to be agreed to by both parties, both the contractor and the public body. I'm not sure how relevant a history of change order is, but nobody's coming up and, uh, and, and just escalating the cost of a construction project in that way since the awarding body can simply deny the change order or cost of change order if they believe it to be unfair. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and <clears throat> members of the committee, my name is Jared Rosenau, 2023 AGC Nevada president and um, president of Clark Sullivan Construction. We're a general contractor headquartered in Sparks, Nevada. We oppose this bill as written and oppose as presented with the amendment. We have a long-standing history of performing public works projects. While I appreciate the word may has been inserted for these different criteria, <clears throat> what you have this is a, is a boilerplate, is a scenario where many, many different public bodies can now create many, many different subjectivities that are loose and um, not identified here by which to um, qualify or disqualify a contractor who may or may not be a parent low. Um, uh, or our best value. I mirror um, all of the testimony of the three uh, my three colleagues prior to me in the interest of brevity and um, urge the committee not to move this bill forward. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to join us in opposition? Seeing none, BPS, is there anybody wishing to join us in opposition for Assembly Bill 171 over the phone? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And next we'll go to those wishing to testify in the neutral position, Carson City or Las Vegas. Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And if I could please have our assemblywoman, uh, any closing remarks you may have. Greg Esposito, for the record, I uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to present this bill today. Um, I don't see uh, uh, Ms. Joanna Jacob from Clark County in the room. She had given me permission to say that they are now neutral, uh, given the amendments. Um, they, you know, she feels it's a, a decent bid delivery system if, if approved. Um, and the only thing I would say in response to the testimony given was that the CMAR process, I don't think I need to go over what CMAR is to any of the body in the committee. Everyone knows it. It's a pretty complicated process, and I think this delivery method um, is just a simpler way. I appreciate that, yes, uh, counties would have to create, or municipalities would have to create criteria on how to judge contractors. Uh, this would just give them the opportunity to do that if they saw fit for a project. And thank you for your time. And uh, before we let you off the hook, Senator Goykachia, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I really appreciate the May language in there. Definitely makes it enabling, but I listening to the opposition I can see where that would be a concern if a public body then in fact used your bill in this vehicle to bid shop you know disqualify the lowest responsive bidder because you know just out of personal preference and they so oh, we're going to use it this time because we know so-and-so is going to come in with a low bid I can say this is contractors probably can't but uh, you know I am concerned about that then this becomes a tool. Normally, they would never even consider it, but then maybe they get into a close bid on on a project, and with the preferred bidder, they would like to choose, and they would use this to disqualify the lowest responsive bidder. And thank you for that. 
Members, any additional comments, questions? And with that, Assemblywoman, thank you again for your presentation. Uh, and thank you for your consideration, and you have a, a hard job ahead of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Esposito. Thank you for the work. Uh, with that, I'd, uh, I'd like to go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 171, and next open up a hearing on Assembly Bill 173. Welcome, Assembly Member. Good afternoon, Assembly Member, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and uh, Senators. Uh, thank you guys for allowing us to be here today to present this bill. Um, hopefully it'll clear up some uh, issues with the process. And today I'm joined by Alexis Motorax and Jarrett Rosenau. Uh, they will answer all your technical questions. They're much more in tune with this, but I do wanna let, uh, let you guys know they've worked very hard to get to the point where we are today to bring this to you guys. And again, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, present this. I'll now turn it over to Alexis to go through the, uh, the workings of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Alexis Motorex with the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors, representing the commercial construction industry in Northern Nevada. And I'm pleased to help present AB 173 and wanna thank Assemblyman Gray for sponsoring the bill. The purpose of this bill is really quite simple to standardize the way every public owner requires the listing of subcontractors for public works. Current law is confusing, contains seldom used provisions, and is inconsistent on when smaller subcontractors are required to be listed. Our goal is to make it easier for both contractors and public bodies to comply with the law, maintain transparency, and minimize the number of bid protests and or bids being deemed non-responsive because they didn't get the numbers right in the formula currently required. Our proposal maintains that contractors must submit a listing for any first tier subcontractor on a public work bid for a scope of work ex amount exceeding 5% of the total bid price at the time of bid opening. It deletes the owner's the option of the public owner to require a 3% listing option. It is seldomly used and when it is used, it is most often used incorrectly. It's confusing for both contractors and public owners and leads to bids being disputed or deemed non-responsive for accidentally listing subs incorrectly. <coughs> Additionally, AB 173 eliminates the language requiring the listing of subcontractors who will complete work greater than $250,000. But if not greater than $250,000, then $50,000 or 1% of the total bid price, whichever is greater. <coughs> This language, too, is confusing, requires a listing of the 1% list only on contracts larger than $1 million, and standardizes subcontractors listing after $25 million. Instead, this measure will simply require contractors who submit bids to still provide their 5% list at the time, and mandates that after bid opening, the three lowest bidders submit a, bid, submit a list of first-tier subcontractors providing any work totaling $100,000 or more within two hours of completion of the opening of bids. The $50,000 limit for the 1% one, for the 1 language was put into statute in 1993. Then when adjusted for infl inflation, that represent, represents 104,000 today. This is not dissimilar to conversations we've had with our partners in labor about adjusting revenue for the highway fund because it too hasn't been adjusted since 1993. And we all know 1990, a 1993 dollar has much less buying power 30 years later. But more importantly, this bill makes the process of bidding public works easier and more transparent for everyone involved and allows public owners an easier path to bidding and awarding their projects. I have with me today Jarrett Rosenau, Clark Sullivan Construction, who can better explain what this change means in actual practice. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, Chairman and members of the committee, <clears throat> for the record, I'm Jarrett Rosenau, 2023 President for Nevada AGC and President of Clark Sullivan Construction. We're a general contractor located in Sparks, Nevada. We've been a builder in Northern Nevada for almost 50 years with extensive public works and bidding experience. Alexis did a great job of explaining our why for AB 173. So I'm gonna describe what a bid day looks, what a day looks like for us in the bid room. It's quite chaotic. We organize our team around bid scopes and assign scoping spreadsheets for the project. For example, one person will communicate throughout the day with all bidding subcontractors for electrical, another for structural steel, another for mechanical, and so on. 
Our goal is to have one point of contact responsible to ensure they're bidding all the scope of work necessary based on plans and specs. We typically see scope letters from subcontractors initially um, without proposal values because they're still finalizing their proposals and are waiting for supplier pricing, which sometimes comes very late. Some trades are great to give an example time, but some are at the mercy of their suppliers who hold. This sometimes makes the last 15 minutes of the bid both exciting and very stressful. And throughout the day, <clears throat> we're constantly confirming our estimated value of the project to ensure our team understands the cutoff for the 5% listing, especially if we think the project is within the value of the range of 5 million and 25 million for the reasons Alexis described. That calculation is constantly changing based on changes in the value throughout the day, which potentially increases the opportunity for a mistake to be made in the 5% listing. Once our proposal is submitted and bids are opened, we learned if we are to submit a 1% two hour listing to the public owner and as Alexis explained, there are currently multiple scenarios in the statute that determine how this calculation is made. It's an actual calculation of 1% against the contractor's total bid. If the project value is between five and 25 million and a fixed value of 250 or greater for project exceed the 25. It's also important to note how this very information does vary from the viewpoint of the public owner. If three bidding contractors have qualified for the two hour 1%, they will all have different bid values. And if the project value is between the five and 25, each will have a different 1% calculation on the two hour listing. <clears throat> In addition, subcontractors do provide different pricing to general, different to different general contractors, believe it or not, based on history and experience with the general contractors which could also vary in the names provided in either the 5% or the 1% two hour, then opening the door for more potential confusion at the public owner level as they, confirm all, as they work to confirm all contractors can be qualified as responsible under the law. So there's a lot of moving parts and pieces, and because of the variations in the 1% listing calculations currently in statute, there are many unintended consequences that could and have occurred. No contractor wants to spend the time and resources necessary to bid a project only to lose it based on a misunderstanding or technicality in statute. And no public owner wants to spend the time and resources to advertise and procure a project to only have to restart their process or be mired down in a messy bid protest situation. Public owners who advertise projects want to move forward with projects. We believe AB 173 achieves this by removing the language of the ranged calculations and simply saying that any first tier contractor performing work that exceeds $100,000 needs to be part of the two hour listing. Thank you for the opportunity to present today and welcome any questions you have now. And thank you. Oh, please. Thank you, Senator. Um, well, first, I, I do want to apologize. I wanted to thank, Sen thank Senator Daly also for sponsoring this bill as well. Um, I hope you all see that uh, the process as it currently stands is clear as mud. <laughs> the, uh, it, it, this will add more confidence uh, in the bids that are provided um, on public projects and will allow for a more expeditious process. So really hoping you guys can, uh, you know, can support this and uh, we are open for questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you working with Senator Daly. Very few things excite him more than bidding. Maybe prevailing wage and maybe some references to some, some really cool old school movies. But with that, we will open it up with Senator Daly. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, yes, happy to, to work on that. On that. Uh, I know they got a last minute bill, so thank you for, for having one available. <clears throat> Just wanted to clarify one thing, because I know I've heard back and forth from uh, some people. And the $250,000 uh, level that's, that's in there, now was something that I put in uh, in previous sessions and various things to solve a problem. This will eliminate that problem that we were trying to solve there. I also agree with eliminating that 3% option. I've only seen it used two or three times and I've never seen it used properly. It resulted in litigation twice, anyway. Um, the one thing I did want to get on the record just so I'm clear and some other people are clear. So if you do some of the math, if you have a uh, two million dollar project, uh, the five percent of the two million dollars and the hundred thousand are the same number. So if the project is a two million dollar bid, you're going to be listing your five percent people and they would be the only ones, right? Um, 
But if a project is under $2 million, you would never get to a 1% list, but you would still have to list your 5% people. So smaller subcontracts and various things are going to get in there. I just wanted that to be clear and on the record that the $100,000 isn't any contractor who's Con contractors will be listed if they're doing under that, if it's a smaller public work, if they're doing 5% of the, of the work. Um, so I think that works with how you guys bid it, and it's a one-time calculation, easier to do and list that. But if it's a smaller public work, you're still going to capture uh, work at under $100,000 on the 5% list. They're not in. Alexis Moderex with the Nevada Chapter AGC. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. And thank you, members. Any additional questions? Senator Guaycachia, please. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess if that's going to be a problem, we can raise the prevailing wage limit to $2 million and then it wouldn't be a conflict. Why, 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 why are you throwing rocks like that, man? Come on. <laughs> I am glad there are people in between them, too. Um, members, any additional questions? Seeing none, thank you again for the presentation. I'd like to invite you three to please sit back. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Assembly Member. And with that, we will, uh, we will invite those wishing to testify and support either Carson City or Las Vegas. Thank you, Chair Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jennifer Berthume, Government Affairs Manager at the Nevada Association of Counties. NACO is in support of AB 173 as it brings clarity and simplification to the public works bidding process and lowers the administrative burden for all public agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Nixa County, City of Reno. I think uh, you're probably used to hearing that uh, bills might add to the administrative burden, so I'll just say that this makes it a little bit easier on the cities and appreciate the work of the bill sponsors. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, please. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, Jessica Ferrado here today on behalf of Granite Construction in support of the bill. I want to thank the pr proponents for bringing it forward. And thank you for joining us, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Stephen Wood, representing the Nevada League of Cities and Municipalities. I'll just echo the comments of my local government um, uh, colleagues and thank the sponsor and the stakeholders for their work. And thank you for joining us, please. Thank you, Chair Flores and members of the Government Affairs Committee. For the record, I'm Ann Barnett, CEO of the Nevada Contractors Association. We are in support of this legislation, and we thank Assemblyman Gray for bringing it forward. For several uh, years, the subcontractor listing statutes have been challenging, and this creates much-needed much clarity for our members. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Michael Hillerby on behalf of the Regional Transportation Commission of Washoe County to add our support to the previous comments. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Isaac Hardy representing the Urban Consortium, which is made up of Reno, Sparks, Henderson, Las Vegas, and North Las Vegas. Uh, just want to echo everybody's comments. We are here in support. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Anyone else wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 173? Carson City, Las Vegas, C, none. BPS, do we have anybody else wishing to join us over the phone in support of Assembly Bill 173? If you would like to testify in support of AB 173, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller. Thank you. My name is Darcy. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Darcy Carpenter. I'm with Sierra Nevada Construction, and I wanted to testify in support. I think this bill is important to cleaning up the process. Thank you so much to Assemblyman Gray. And if I could just have you repeat your name for the record, I just want to make sure our team got it. Maybe too late. If somebody knows her personally, if you could just provide a spelling to my team, I want to make sure we got that. BPS, next caller in support, please. Caller 420, you're still there? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. 
Thank you. Next, we'll go to those wishing to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 173, Carson City or Las Vegas. Oh, I thought you were joining us. You didn't want to join the fun? All right. Um, so I would like to invite those uh, to join us over the phone. Assembly Bill 173, opposition. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Uh, Lastly, we'll take those wishing to testify in the neutral position for Assembly Bill 173, Carson City, Las Vegas. Seeing none, we will go to those wishing to testify in the neutral position over the phone. BPS, please. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. And with that, uh, Assembly, uh, Assemblyman Gray, if you could please come back. And uh, I believe we have a point of clarification or question from Senator Daly. And uh, it's not for the assemblyman, it's for my colleague from Eureka. And to clarify the record, clarify the record, the threshold for prevailing wage is irrelevant to the process for bidding, right? So raising the prevailing wage or not raising the prevailing wage threshold application is not uh, going to affect any of the bidding procedure, just for the record. Mr. Chair, I appreciate the correction, but I had to get the dig in. Thank you. Assemblyman <laughs> <laughs> Gray, please, any closing remarks? Again, I just wanted to thank you guys. Uh, this is the first time I presented on the Senate side ever, and uh, it was uh, actually a pleasure. It was easier presenting here than it was on the Assembly side. I do want to mention my team again, though. Um, there was some consternation with this bill, and I think it's a testament to how hard they've worked, and we've all, you know, sitting down with the stakeholders to get to the point where we had uh, no, uh, no testimony in opposition. So thank you guys again. Thank you. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 173. And members, uh, we, because we don't have Senator Ornshaw here, however, he is doing opposition testimony in his last bill presentation, so he should be joining us momentarily. We will go into a very brief recess. I ask that we don't leave. I think he should be here momentarily. We are in recess. The Senate Committee on Government Affairs will come back to order. Um, and we will go ahead and proceed with the work session document. Uh, Mr. McDonald, we'll start off with Assembly Bill 3, please. Jared McDonald, Research Division, Legislative Council Bureau. Uh, Assembly Bill 3 revises provisions governing financial reports of the State Permanent School Fund. Uh, this bill was sponsored on behalf of the State Controller and heard on May 1st. MERS? Excuse me, May 1st. The bill requires a state controller to prepare a complete financial report of the state permanent school fund annually instead of quarterly. We have no amendments on this measure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. At this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to do pass Assembly Bill 3. Motion to do 
Uh, assembly, excuse me, Senator Krasner has made the motion to do pass Assembly Bill 3. Do I have a second? second. Senator Goykachia has seconded that motion. Members, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. And Senator Goykachia, if I could please ask if you are comfortable carrying that floor statement. Yes, Senator Goykachia will carry the floor statement on Assembly Bill 3. Next on the work session document, Assembly Bill 18. Mr. McDonald, please. Assembly Bill 18 revises provisions relating to the Division of Enterprise Information Technology Services. Uh, this bill was sponsored uh, by, this, by the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs on behalf of the agency and heard on April 19th. Uh, the bill revises the composition of the Division of Enterprise Information Technology Services and modernizes certain statutory language to better, de better define the work of the division. We have no amendments on this measure. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Mr. McDonald. At this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to do pass Assembly Bill 18. Uh, Senator Daly has made the motion to do pass Assembly Bill 18. Do I have a second? second. Senator Goykachia has seconded that motion. Members, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. And if I could please ask Senator Daly to do that floor statement. Senator Daly will do the floor statement on Assembly Bill 18. Next, we have Assembly Bill 36. Mr. McDonald, please. Assembly Bill 36 provides provisions related to veterans and was sponsored uh, on behalf of the Department of Vet Services and heard in this committee on April 19th. The bill adds three ex officio members to the Interagency Council on Veterans Affairs. Uh, the measure also revises certain reporting requirements for certain state agencies and regulatory bodies. Uh, and then finally, the measure changes from calendar years to fiscal years, the reporting timeline for certain reports that are, re are submitted to the Council and the Nevada Veterans Services Commission. And we have no amendments on this measure. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. At this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to do pass Assembly Bill 36. Uh, Senator Krasner has made the motion to do pass Assembly Bill 36. Do I have a second? Yes, Senator Daly has seconded that motion. Members, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Senator Krasner, if we could please have you do the floor statement. Senator Krasner will do the floor statement on Assembly Bill 36. Next on the work session document, Assembly Bill 44. Assembly Bill 44 revises provisions related to services for veterans. This bill was sponsored on behalf of the Department of Veteran Services by the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs and heard on May 1st. Uh, the bill revises the titles of the deputy directors of the Department of Vet Services and certain duties of the director of the department. The measure requires the director to provide quarterly training to veteran service officers employed by the department and to additionally offer the training to representatives of veteran service organizations who are accredited by the United States Department of Veterans Affairs located in this state. We have no amendments on this measure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to entertain a motion to do pass Assembly Bill 44. Senator Krasner has made the motion to do pass Assembly Bill 44. Do I have a second? Senator Goykachia has seconded that motion. Members, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, excuse me. Yeah, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. Motion carries unanimously. And if I could again, Senator Goykachia ask that you please carry the floor statement on Assembly Bill 44. Thank you. Next on the work session document, Assembly Bill 60. Assembly Bill 60 revises provisions governing local improvements. This bill was sponsored be, by um, the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs on behalf of the Nevada League of Cities and heard on May 3rd. The bill requires the governing body of a municipality that re, uh, acquires or improves a neighborhood improvement project to annually prepare an amendment to the assessment role and an estimate of the expenditures for the next fiscal year, provide notice and hold a public hearing regarding the amendment and confirm and mail notice of the amendment. Uh, we do have one amendment for this bill, and you can take a look at that uh, conceptual amendment on the next page. This was sponsored by the city of Henderson, and it proposes to amend the bill to require the governing body of a mu municipality to consider an amendment to the assessment role as a separate item on an agenda and must not be part of any items on the agenda approved as a group through a single motion. Uh, that's all we have for this bill. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to entertain a mo motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 60. Uh, Senator Daly has made the motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 60. Do I have a second? Senator Goykachia has seconded that motion. Members, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. 
Those against say nay. Motion carries unanimously. And if I may ask Senator Krasner, if you could please do that floor statement. Senator Krasner will do the floor statement on Assembly Bill 60. Next on the work session document, Assembly Bill 82. Assembly Bill 82 designates World Esports Day as a day of observance in this state. This was sponsored by Assemblywoman, Assemblywoman Mosca and heard on April 19th. The bill requires the governor to proclaim annually this Saturday immediately preceding the last Saturday in October as E-World Sports Day. We have no amendments on this bill. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to enter entertain a motion to do pass Assembly Bill 82. Senator Krasner has enthusiastically, in a very esports way, made the motion to do pass Assembly Bill 82. Do I have a second? Sen <laughs> Senator Goykachia, who is an avid uh, video game player himself, has seconded that motion. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. And Senator Goykachia, who is a hardcore fan of Madden and FIFA um, will speak about his, uh, his experience with PlayStation um, on the floor. He will have the floor statement. Thank you, Senator Goykachia. Next on the work session document is Assembly Bill 189. Assembly Bill 189 revises provisions governing construction start times in certain counties and cities. This was sponsored by Assemblywoman Haudegui and heard on May 8th. The, the bill provides that if the Board of County Commissioners in a county whose population is 700,000 or more, or the governing body of a city that is located in such a county adopts an ordinance, restrict the hours in which the construction uh, work may begin in a common interest community in which the original developer controls a majority of the units. The hours for construction work in such a community must be allowed to begin at, but not earlier than 5 a.m. during the period beginning April 1 and ending on September 30th. We have no amendments for this measure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to do pass Assembly Bill 189. Senator Daly has made the motion to do pass Assembly Bill 189. Do I have a second? Senator Krasner has seconded that motion. Members, any discussion? Senator Goykachia, please. Thank you. Just a comment for the record. And again, I wish that we'll catch it next session maybe, but I wish there was some way to have a waiver on a particular project, even though, you know, it's, uh, there are projects you need to start quicker than 5 o'clock in the morning. So even I don't care whether they're sleeping or not. Thank you. And thank you for that, uh, Senator. Members, any additional discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. And if I could please ask Assemblyman Daly to do the floor statement on Assembly Bill 189. Assemblyman Daly will do the floor statement on Assembly Bill 189. Next on the work session document, Assembly Bill 210. Assembly Bill, uh, Assembly Bill 210 revises provisions governing public works. This was sponsored by Assemblywoman Duran and others and heard on May 5th. Uh, the bill requires each contractor engaged on a public work to provide his or her workers with a written or electronic notice that sets forth the website of the labor commissioner where the prevailing wage rates for the public work project are posted, the name of the contractor, and the physical address of the principal place of business of the contractor. Uh, the contractor must receive and retain for at least two years an acknowledgement of receipt of the notice. And then finally, the bill requires a person found to have willfully or repeatedly failed to pay the prevailing wage to pay an affected work worker damages in an amount equal to the difference between the prevailing wages required to be paid and the wages the contractor or subcontractor actually paid to the affected worker. And we do have one amendment proposed for this me uh, measure. Um, the committee chair proposes to amend the bill to clarify that the written or electronic notice must be provided at the time of hire. And you can take a look at a mock-up that was provided on page 11 in your work session document. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. At this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 210. Senator Daly has made the motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 210. Do I have a second? Senator Goykachia has seconded that motion. Members, any discussion? Senator Goykachia, please. Thank you, and I want to make sure I get it on the record. I thank uh, the proponent of the bill and uh, for getting that line in there at the time of hire, once and one time only. And I've been assured 
everyone's agreeable with that. So thank you. We see everybody saying yes. The once hardcore advocates against one another are now friends and an alliance. <laughs> Members, any additional comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. Motion carries unanimously. And Senator Krasner, if we could please have you do the floor statement. Senator Krasner will do the floor statement in Assembly Bill 210. Next on the work session document is Assembly Bill 219. Assembly Bill 219 makes various changes to the open meeting law. This was sponsored by Assemblywoman Constantine and heard on May 8th. This bill provides that if the agenda for a meeting of a public body authorizes the continuation of the meeting to one or more other calendar days, the public comment must be held each day of the, of the meeting and certain times during the meeting. Public notice of the meeting of a public body must be posted on the principal office of the public body or if the meeting has a physical location at the building in which the meeting is to be held. The agenda for a meeting that is held exclusively by remote technology system must include clear and complete instructions for the public to be able to call into the meeting to provide public comment and the instructions must be read verbally at the meeting before the first public comment period. And we have no amendments on this measure. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. At this point, I'd like to entertain a motion to do pass Assembly Bill 219. Senator Daly has made the motion to do pass Assembly Bill 219. Do I have a second? Senator Goikachia has seconded that motion. Members, any discussion? Senator Goikachia, please. Yes, thank you. And I just want to clarify the way I understand the bill and uh, stand for correction if I'm wrong. You have to have public comment at the start and at the end of the meeting, and it's only enabling if you want to take public comment prior to any, any action item. We do have the bill sponsor, but we also have our extraordinary attorney who could equally answer that question. Thank you, Senator Gokuchia, through um, Chair Flores. Yes, you have the option to do one or the other. Yes. And if I could have you state your name. Uh, again, clarification, if I, I may, though, you have to have it at the start and the end of, the, of any meeting, correct? And then it's only optional if you want to have it. And, and, and if we could have any Ms. Objection. Our, our committee counsel, Ms. Clarson, please. Okay. For the record, this is Heidi Clarson with the Legislative Council of Bureau. So I believe that Senator Goigachia's question, question um, is uh, aimed at Section 1 of the bill, which um, for the most part reorganizes the current uh, public comment requirements under the open meeting law. Um, in subsection 1 of Section 1, it says um, that comments by the general public must be taken by a public body at the beginning of the meeting before any items on which action may be taken or heard and again before the adjournment of the meeting or paragraph B after each item on the agenda. So if um, this part is not a substantive change to the open meeting law, but um, they don't have to take it at the beginning if they're going to take public comment after each action item. Thank you for that clarification. I'm good either. I like the first best. <laughs> Thank you. Members, any additional questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Um, and we will have Senator Krasner, could we please have you do that floor statement? Senator Krasner, enthusiastically, will do the floor statement for Assembly Bill 219. Last on the work session document, we have Assembly Bill 366. Uh, Assembly Bill 366 revises provisions governing the Keep Nevada Working Task Force. This bill was sponsored by the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs and was heard in this committee on May 3rd. The bill moves the Keep Nevada Working Task Force from the Office of the Lieutenant Governor to the Office of the Secretary of State and revises the membership of the task force. We did have one amendment that was submitted by Assemblyman De Silva, and you can take a look at on the, that amendment on the next page. The amendment proposes to amend the bill to remove statewide as a qualifying requirement for a representative from labor. And that is all we have on this bill. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. And with that, I'd like to entertain a motion to do pass Assembly Bill 366. 
Senator Krasner has made the motion to do pass Assembly Bill 366. Uh, excuse me, amend and do pass. Thank you. And for the, just for the record, just for the, <laughs> to, uh, um, to make it abundantly clear, amend and do pass Assembly Bill 366. Senator Krasner has made the motion to amend and do pass. Do I have a second? Senator Goykachia enthusiastically agrees to amend and do pass and has second that. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. Motion carries unanimously. And if I could please have Assemblyman Daly do the floor statement. Assemblyman Daly will do the floor statement for Assembly Bill 366. Because I, I call them assembly member. <laughs> Senator Daly will take care of uh, Assembly Bill 366. Um, and with that, we will go to the last item on the agenda, with, which is those wishing to join us for public comment. Anybody wishing to join us for public comment in Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, VPS, is there anybody wishing to join us over the phone for public comment? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Uh, so members, just for lay of the land, we will have a lengthy work session document for Friday. Uh, my understanding is both the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate Education Committee intend to meet earlier than usual on Friday, which would hopefully give us an opportunity to also meet earlier here. However, we said that for the past two meetings, and uh, we started almost exactly at the same exact start time. So we will have the meeting at the call of the chair, but hopefully we can meet immediately after Judiciary and Education uh, have concluded to allow you um, to go home or do whatever you got to do and take care of your families. Um, but that is a game plan for now. Uh, there, there will be a lengthy work session document that we will try to get to, out to everybody well ahead of the meeting so that you have time to review every bill and, and if there's any concerns so that we have an understanding. We may not have support for all the bills, so I, I do ask that you just let me know. I don't want to embarrass anybody and have them come in here if they don't have the votes, we'll just remove it off the agenda, and it is what it is. Um, so with that, uh, oh, before I say this meeting's adjourned, uh, Senator Goyke Chia, and just because he's celebrating eSports Day, will be having uh, video games in his office immediately at the conclusion of this meeting. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>